Representative Nash, Representative Cheney, thanks for joining me. Uh, today I wanted to dive into the IDOC budget and some other issues around the justice system. IDOC did have a substantial budget increase, but notably uh, there was a funding request for a new prison. It would be a little over 800 bed um, women's facility built out at the CUNA complex. Uh, Representative Cheney, you supported that legislation. Can you talk to me about um, what the new women's facility do you feel that would be uh, beneficial to IDOC? It will be, and it's uh, spending that's in a form that allows us to save money in the long term, which is important. We have a lot of one-time money that maybe we can't put into our revenue stream long term, uh, but uh, we need to find a way to save money in the long term because eventually, one way or another, that money has to be paid back. So in, uh, hard infrastructure is a good way to do that, and the women's prison is a great way to save money in the long term by paying, essentially paying cash for it. We save uh, millions and millions of dollars in interest as compared to if we did bonding for it. Uh, we also save the cost of out-of-state placement uh, and just the savings on out-of-state placement would cover most of the cost of that prison within the next decade. And so as far as dollars and cents, it makes a lot of uh, rational sense to, to use our one-time money to build that facility to bring our out-of-state inmates back to, uh, to the, the state of Idaho, which allows them a, a better onboarding process to get back into society because their families have closer contact, their, their communities have closer contact. And so overall, I, it was uh, what I think is a, a, a smart move by the legislature. Sure. For listeners who may not know, um, the state of Idaho has their over capacity with inmates and so they do house some inmates at a private prison in Arizona. As of Tuesday that number was 474 men that were housed out of state because there wasn't room for them at the state facility. Uh, Representative Nash, you uh, expressed some concern around women's incarceration. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, I think the intent behind the prison um, is good in how can we reduce county and out-of-state placement and how can we save some of these costs. Uh, my concern with it is that it's very divorced from the policy question of uh, are we safer being the number one incarcerator of women in America? And I think at some point there are diminishing returns on how many people we're incarcerating um, to keep ourselves safe. And I wanna have that policy conversation at the same time when we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on new prison beds. So I wanna shift a little bit to, um, so IDOC is not responsible for sentencing, but judges are. So let's shift the conversation to the Judicial Council. There was a bill that would have made some amendments to uh, the Judicial Council and ways that attorneys are recommended for judgeship. Uh, the governor vetoed that this week. Um, Representative Cheney, you sponsored that bill. Can you uh, walk me through what that legislation would have done and your thoughts on the veto? Absolutely, what the legislation would have done is make sure that there was a, a broad practice area of representation among the attorney members on that commission. And it would have uh, increased the number of votes necessary to recommend the filling of a judicial vacancy so that the private sector members uh, maintained their influence on the, on the council as well. Uh, additionally, it would have provided some uh, limited transparency in revealing some of the criteria used by the council at making their recommendations to the governor, and it would have allowed the governor to essentially throw back one list of, of nominees. So the council right now is primarily responsible for discipline of, of judges, but they also send a list of two to four uh, people to the governor whenever there's a district uh, appellate or Supreme Court vacancy for the governor to make an appointment from, and it would have allowed one slate to be, be rejected fully, um, but then the second one would have still been compulsory for the governor. Uh, that was vetoed, and I, I understand the reasoning behind the governor's veto. Uh, we, it would be good to have some additional time to study and collaborate. I think that uh, we did good work. I think it's the right policy in the right direction. Uh, nonetheless, for the, the legislature, we, we are the least affected by this piece of legislation. Both the judiciary and the executive branches are more affected by this legislation than we are. And so where both, both of those branches are saying, well, well, slow up, I think it's important that we, we maybe slow down and we don't do something unilaterally that really doesn't affect us as a branch, uh, but affects the other two branches. Representative Nash, that uh, while that bill did pass, it was a narrow 
uh, vote. I know that you voted in opposition to it. What were your concerns with the Judicial Council changes? Yeah, the Judicial Council was formed 55 years ago as part of the modernization of the judiciary. Um, this is an institution that's that's kept its current form. Um, I was actually looking through legislative history on this, and my wife's great grandfather was on the committee that formed this set, like so long ago. Um, it's it's really uh, speaks to uh, its enduring nature. It speaks to the quality of judges that it's been able to um, recommend to the governor. And um, my concerns with this, uh, without getting into the, the substance of the bill, are more around process. Uh, if we're going to have a uh, a once in a generation change to this institution that, um, by all accounts, is is working quite well, uh, we need to have more input and um, more public input in, in this process from the other branches of government and from affected stakeholders. And I'm hopeful that the process that the Chief Justice has recommended, uh, that the governor has shown an interest in participating in, uh, would be the appropriate means uh, to get that input so that if we do need to make changes, which I think a lot of folks would like to see us do to help with uh, judicial recruitment, which is, remains a challenge, uh, that that process will um, be able to deliver on any necessary reforms. And that'll be a working group that the Supreme Court is trying to establish, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I want to move on to a more controversial bill that I would say this year created some um, real somber discussions, and that would be um, regarding lethal injections and um, where the chemicals used in lethal injection are uh, obtained. Representative Cheney, can you tell me what uh, 658, what House Bill 658 would have done? 658 uh, allows the Department of Corrections to keep anonymous the source of lethal injection drugs and the identities of those who are involved in the uh, execution protocols. It doesn't keep the, the identity of the chemical uh, or the qualifications of the people involved confidential. That's still available information um, and it's also available to the um, the condemned if you will to independently s sample and test the chemicals so to confirm that they are of the the nature and quality that that they claim to be and so there's a lot that it doesn't make anonymous but but these crucial pieces it does make anonymous for the purposes of avoiding um, using public pressure to effectively eliminate the death penalty I mean, if, if the death penalty is to be eliminated, that's not something that I would support, but it should be something that goes through the ballot box and through the, the uh, legislative process, not something that is done by fiat, essentially, by putting enough public pressure on uh, chemical providers or, or even those who, who might be members of, of the execution protocol team uh, to the point where it's functionally impossible. The, the department was put in an incredibly difficult position in being unable to obtain those chemicals, but still having, under Idaho statute, an obligation to carry out the, these sentences as imposed by juries across the state. Uh, Representative Nash, an issue you addressed was um, the names of those suppliers also would not be discoverable in court. The reason that we are aware of um, where the chemicals were obtained for uh, Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Levitt, the last two men in Idaho to be executed, is they came through uh, court. Uh, what, what was some of your opposition to the bill? Well, uh, one of the issues is, is that uh, um, dozens of manufacturers of these drugs, all FDA approved uh, providers of these drugs, um, have uh, contracts in place um, that um, eliminate their ability that uh, to supply these drugs. They don't want to be a part of it. And they're, they will be unable to enforce those contracts if it's not discoverable, if they are, if they, they won't even know if they're actually supplying the drugs uh, for lethal injection at this point in the state of Idaho. And uh, I guess my bigger concern is that when we give the government the ability to take life, um, whether you consider that justified or not, um, that is an incredible power, and that needs as much sunlight on it as possible. And um, Idaho does not have a great track record with transparency when it comes to this process. I mean, there, the last couple executions have been shrouded in allegations of um, private 
chartered planes, suitcases full of cash, and, um, keeping two sets of books to hide those transactions. Uh, and that gives me pause. Uh, if we're going to give government the power to take life, uh, the public has a right to know everything about that process. Um, so that's where I'm coming from on my opposition to that bill. The governor did sign that legislation, and I know uh, Mr. Pizzuto, Gerald Pizzuto, is pending appeals. He narrowly avoided execution in June, and so we'll see how that moves forward. Um, but in the meantime, I appreciate your time, gentlemen, and hopefully you'll see Signy die soon. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, of course.